If you know me and my work, then you know that I talk a lot about identity and especially how your accent is a big part of your identity. Your accent tells the story of your life. But if you do want to change your accent or improve your pronunciation, how do you do it? Recently, I had the pleasure of talking to someone with expert answers to that question. Eric Singer, a dialect coach who helps film and television actors to speak with an accent that is not their native accent. And because of this, he knows exactly what it takes mentally and physically to change the way you speak. In this interview, we talk about how to change your accent, the best ways to practice, but more importantly, if and why you should try to speak like a native. If you would like to listen to this interview as a podcast, you will find a link down in the description box where you will also find a link to Eric's website which has lots of amazing content about different aspects of accent and pronunciation. I hope you enjoy it. Eric Singer, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me today. My pleasure. Glad to be here. For people who don't know you and your work, could you just introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what you do? Sure. Uh, so I'm a dialect coach. Um, so I work with, uh, predominantly with actors um, in film and TV. Uh, who need to speak with an accent that is not uh, their native accent, or in some cases also uh, working with actors to sound like they are speakers of a language that they don't speak, uh, and usually that I don't speak. Um, so that's, that's extra fun, but uh, you know, is essentially uh, working with the same tools and working in the same way. Um, I will also work with uh, uh, non-native speaking actors, uh, who are working in English um, to, uh, you know, to sound uh, as intelligible as possible, or in some cases we really are going for trying to get close to sounding like a native speaker. Um, and I'll, I'll do the same things uh, with, uh, with actors as private clients uh, and, uh, and on productions as well. So that's, that's basically the, the scope of it. So I've kind of spent most of the past 10 years telling um, students, my students who are foreign learners, that they will never lose their accent, which is basically your job. And, and I'm wondering what's your kind of gut reaction to that, to, to, my, to my statement? I, uh, well, first of all, I wouldn't say it is basically my job. Um, that is, you know, that is a, a uh, working with non-native speakers to sound more like native speakers is, is a thing that comes up and it's part of it. But I mean, I, I would say more often uh, I'm working with native speakers of English to sound like native speakers of a different variety of English, uh, or as I said, working on a different language. Um, but it is part of it for sure. Um, you know, I think that's probably a good message, um, and I'm sure that it's that it's underlined by you know an even more important one, which is um, you know maybe that shouldn't be the goal, um, which is that uh, in fact uh, you know effortless intelligibility obviously is something you want in a second language, um, but that the it's it is on the one hand such a feat. It is achievable. I, I do think so. I, you know, I wouldn't agree with the underlying message in, in terms of sort of actual, like, is it absolutely impossible for anyone who doesn't speak a language natively, who's, you know, who's, who's acquiring a second language over the age of, you know, 12 or 13 or something to ever sound like a native speaker? Uh, I do actually think that in some cases uh, it is possible, but it is a feat. It's really a feat and it takes a lot of time and a lot of work and a lot of motivation. Um, and I think, you know, it's absolutely right uh, both given the amount, you know, that it requires uh, and, and, and what a feat it is to question it, but also um, just to question it on a more basic level of, well, you know, why? why? Why should that be the goal? Why should we really want that? Um, I do understand that a lot of native speakers desire that. I, a lot of them come to me as private clients, um, you know, and I will work to support them while being, you know, sort of uh, as, as honest and straight and realistic about, uh, about the difficulty of the task, um, but also, you know, introducing sort of questions like this about, well, you know, should that necessarily be the best goal? You know, your, if we just stick with, 
you know, first language English speakers for a moment. Accent is incredibly, incredibly complex and fascinating, but is also incredibly uh, tied to the essence of, of, of who we are, who we identify ourselves as being. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a record of group identity and belonging. Um, you know, and this is what sociolinguistics is, is, is all about. And, you know, we're learning more all the time. Um, and human beings are complex, right? We're not just sort of one thing. We belong to multiple different groups in intersecting ways. And we shift our accents um, just as we shift other things about our, ourselves and our presentation, depending on who we're with and what context we're in. Um, but it is, our accent is tied to all of those things and is, a, a, you know, an essential reflection of all of those things. I, I sometimes just shortcut it by saying accent is identity, which I think is not far from the truth. So it does get more complex when you're talking about a second language because you don't have, in the new language, you don't have all those countervailing aspects of identity going back and forth determining your pronunciation. Um, and I think that has two, you know, I think there's two, two big sort of implications there. Um, you know, the first of them is that um, there is identity, uh, you know, tied up in your native language, in the sound system of your native language. Um, and that to be an effective communicator, um, you know, does require a, uh, a potent and vivid self. Um, and a potent and vivid self-presentation. And I think for most, um, you know, adult speakers in a second language, their first language origin is a huge part of what can, can become, can be, can become that effective presentation. Um, you know, I think it's not hard for probably anybody to think of, um, you know, a, a second language speaker uh, in English or in, you know, whatever language you're most familiar with, who is in fact incredibly effective, uh, an incredibly effective communicator and presenter, whether it was, you know, um, the, the Russian uh, history professor you had in college, you know, or, uh, or a boss or a colleague or something like that, or, or a friend who's, um, you know, who's, who is able to be uh, a vivid storyteller and communicator and version of themselves in a second language with an identifiable, uh, you know, sound system coming from their native language. Um, but the other implication that I, that I think it has is also, you know, if you are going to strive towards getting closer to a native speaker like sound, which one? Um, because it's so, again, determined by all these things about identity. Uh, and as I know, you know, and as I'm sure a lot of your listeners know, um, you know, there's, there's standard language ideology and there, you know, there are versions of, of each, you know, the pronunciation of, of each language that are more or less standard and kind of, you know, encoded in textbooks and held up as somehow neutral or right or correct. And these are basically arbitrarily determined and, and in fact, largely fictional as well. Um, so, you know, so it does then produce sort of that, that problem. So which version exactly for a native speaker it's determined by all of these, you know, countervailing complex identity aspects. And if you don't have context for any of that as a non-native speaker, constructing that, constructing that accent uh, is a, an interesting challenge, I think. I would say that um, a majority of learners just have it in their mind without question that their goal is to sound like a native speaker. And I mean, you know, what, what do you think would be a more realistic and perhaps more um, helpful objective for, for somebody who is who, who wants you know an intelligible I think that's it I mean I, I think I think the number one goal is intelligibility I think I think that's the you know to sum it up in a word I think that's the concept I think that's the most appropriate target um, for a speaker of a second language to to achieve and it, I think it kind of sounds to a lot of language learners like a low bar um, like, well, of course I want to be intelligible. That's just basic, right? Um, but it's not. Um, it's, you know, even for, uh, for native speakers, I mean, you know, before I was doing primarily uh, production uh, dialect coaching, I was, I was teaching in, uh, you know, in actor training programs for a number of years. So, so you know, actors, native speaking actors undergo, you know, two or three years of speech training uh, 
so that they're working on the skills of being able to do accents, yes, but, but being able to be effortlessly intelligible across different contexts with, you know, difficult texts and th things like that. Um, so, you know, there's, there's some real skill there involved, even if it's your native language. Um, I think it starts to get very interesting when we look at, okay, well, what is that? What are the determiners of intelligibility? Um, and we can talk, we can go into that a little bit if you want, I think. Um, but, you know, that would be the number one goal. And then, you know, effective dynamic communication. Um, and I think those are very closely related. I think one is just maybe sort of, you know, widening out the scope a little bit. Um, and, you know, and then we're getting into things like the, the sort of, you know, effective use of, of prosody, of intonation um, in a particular variety, things like that. Um, you know, they are to some extent um, stops along the way towards, you know, spy-like sounding like a native speaker. Um, you know, so if, I, I often find practically speaking and working with uh, individual people, whether it's actors or civilians, civilians we call them, uh, <laughs> talking about spies, I'm very confused. Here, um, that, uh, you know, even when that's the goal, and it really is the goal for a lot of people, even after I have, you know, these conversations with them, um, uh, that, you know, we're still working along, it's, it's, we're still working along the same road. We're still basically working on the same things, you know, in terms of what I feed back to them, it might be a little bit different, you know, because if somebody is making very effective contrasts between two or three different roughly similar vowel sounds, but none of them sound exactly like a native speaker version, well, you know, if, if our goal is intelligibility and dynamic effective communication, great, that's fine. We're happy. Um, if the person really is like, no, I want to get as close as I can to a native speaker like sound, then we'll, we'll talk in some more detail about, okay, great. You're making these contrasts between these three vowel sounds absolutely beautifully, totally effective. But let's look at adjustments that we can make if you actually want to try to get closer to that native speaker like sound. So there are places where they diverge, but like for the most part, um, we're, st you know, we're working along the same road. Yeah, um, it's interesting that you brought up the analogy of, of kind of a spy, right? This idea of, well, the idea of a spy is hiding their true identity. And I wonder if you think that, for example, a non-native speaker trying to take on, let's say, a New York accent or a, or a London accent, if that's actually, in a way, a form of deception. Oh, wow. That's a really fraught question. Um, you know, let's, let's think about it. You know, I mean, I guess, huh. are actors lying or are actors telling the truth? Um, you know, what, what I think we find uh, compelling in a great performance by an actor is its truthfulness. It's truthfulness under imaginary circumstances. Um, so, you know, keeping in mind that my particular perspective here, I'm coming from working with actors and we're telling stories. Um, we're telling stories that are made up, but that, you know, have to have the feel of truth for them to be engaging and interesting to an audience. And we all know this, we all respond to this, right? Positively when it works and negatively when it doesn't. Um, so I, I don't think those of us who, you know, do what I do are, are, you know, terribly comfortable thinking of it as deception. Um, but you're not talking about actors, you're talking about, you know, okay, somebody who's, you know, who's a, a, a first language Spanish speaker um, passing as a native. I, I don't know. I think it's individual. Honestly, I, I think it's individual. It does, though, go to, you know, there's, there is an act of imagination involved in uh, fully taking on another sound system. Um, you know, there's an acting task. It's incredibly technical. Speech is physically, right? Because every speech action is, is, a, is the result of a physical action. The sound is just a byproduct of a thing that's happening physically. It is the most complex thing that we do physically. It's immensely complex. So it's hugely technical. And, you know, all of my training and experience and everything I sort of bring to bear um, and, you know, and ideally we have, I, I talk a lot about how, uh, how difficult this process is, even again, if we're just talking about within English, native speaker of English, learning another accent in English. Um, it takes time, uh, time that we don't always have in production, uh, time that we, you know, that I'm, I'm constantly sort of saying, 
please understand this. We need more producers, <laughs> you know, catch up to what audiences expect here. Give us proper prep time, which is six to 12 weeks before we start shooting, you know. Um, because it is so complex, but ultimately when it comes down to it, to fully integrate it and put it all back together is an act of the imagination as well. In spite of all the technical stuff that we adjust and work on and try to get right. You can't fully do it unless you can imagine yourself as somebody who speaks that way. Mm -hmm. And so I think for that very difficult feat um, of a non-native speaker sounding like a native speaker, passing, right? Being able to fool people. Um, it, it does require um, a kind of construction of an alternate self. I don't think that always has to mean uh, the erasure or the abandonment of your prior self or your true self. It's just another one, you know? Um, so I think that's, that's a little bit of a different frame. Now I do, you know, some of the people that I, that I know that I've run across in my life who have accomplished this very difficult feat, surprisingly often, um, they are people who have done something kind of drastic identity wise. And it's not something I would ever recommend to anybody, but I can't help but observe that. In fact, um, you know, I know uh, people who, you know, moved from Germany to the UK in their early twenties, not really speaking any English. And five years later, they sound completely like a native. Nobody can tell the difference, but they never go home. Uh, kind of don't really have ties with friends and family at home, want to be and think of themselves as being English um, or the similar thing, you know, with, with American or Australian. So that's a very drastic thing to do. And, you know, people will, will do those kinds of things in their lives for, you know, whatever sets of personal reasons. It's not something I would ever, ever, ever recommend anybody pursue. Um, and I don't think that's everybody. As I said, I, you know, I think there is a, a, a less, uh, less radical, less drastic uh, version, but it does involve being able to imagine yourself, fully imagine yourself as being, at least in part, at least in a mode of you with a side of you, um, that native speaker. So again, it's, you know, it, it does come down to an aspect of identity. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really interesting perspective. And, and I've seen you in, in, in other interviews, you know, saying that taking on an accent is is an act of the imagination. And to be honest, when I heard it, I was like, well, sure. But as you said, as you said yourself, you know, no, it's, it's actually physical, right? The sound is a result of some physical placement of the anatomy. But then you're right, because it's not, that's not enough, is it? It's like assuming all of the other stuff, the culture and the, then just it's more, right? It's deeper. It's about creating a new person. Yeah, I sometimes talk about accent integration. Um, so, you know, we can get all the tech, this is what, one of the reasons why it takes time, right? Because we can get all the technical things right. Um, it still takes time and practice and that flipping of the switch, that extra little act of imagination or whatever it is for it to be sort of integrated into an actor so that they can act truthfully, right? Behave truthfully through that, in that mode, in that way. Are you worried at all about the the kind of the the movement, you know, the the twenty twenty movement, where um, it, this is in your work with actors, you know, that actors shouldn't um, kind of try to portray identities that are not their own, you know, that that we should have actors who, you know, southern actors should be the only ones doing southern accents, and you know, British actors should be the only ones doing British accents. Let me separate that out into two, because I, I think that um, I, that's not an argument that I necessarily have heard a lot or take seriously if it's, if it's like you can only be what you are. I think what we've seen more of this year um, is, a, is a growing recognition that there are um, backgrounds that actors who are not from or do not share that background should not be playing, have no business playing. Um, you know, it's funny it, because as actors, of course, and I trained as an actor and worked as an actor for many years before I was a coach. Um, so I'm an actor as well. I'm a performer as well. And I come from that side of things. Most of us do, most dialect coaches. And, you know, as actors, we want to be able to do anything, right? That's, that's, that's the ambition, right? Um, it's, it's often what draws people into it, kind of the, you know, the, 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 the burgeoning endless possibilities of being able to be anything. Um, 
And it's really fun. Um, you know, when you, and I did, I've uh, narrated probably about 50 or 60 audiobooks, um, you know, and, and doing audiobooks is really fun because you get to play all the characters, you know, um, done a couple of one and two man shows in my time as an actor where you're playing multiple characters and switching back and forth. So much fun, super fun. Um, and by the way, audiobooks is a place where uh, this will, it's, it's an interesting, it's a tiny little segment of what actors do, right? Although audiobooks in general is, is a big industry, but um, that's a place where we're going to continue to encounter that issue and have to find ways of dealing with it all the time because you, you have individual actors who are narrating books that have a bunch of characters, including BIPOC characters and, you know, if it's a white actor and there are, you know, black characters or Latino characters or things like that. Um, but by and large as an industry, um, you know, so that's an individual actor's perspective maybe, but, you know, <laughs> uh, we live in a society as it were. Um, you know, and we have uh, been recognizing increasingly as an industry and as a society, uh, the history of racist, incredibly hurtful white appropriation of the voices of people that white people have historically oppressed and held down. Um, and, you know, and incredible violence. And then it's all part of that. And that you, you just can't separate those things out. Um, you know, that it's, it's just, um, there's, there's just, you know, no way in a lot of contexts um, for, you know, a white actor uh, to sort of go there and do that and be cast that way without causing hurt and causing harm. Um, so I think, you know, things like Hank Azaria stepping away from voicing up who um, or, you um, uh, Kristen Bell and I think Jenny Slate um, uh, both stepped away from voicing biracial characters in animated series that they had voiced. Um, you know, all people saying, look, we really have no business doing this. That's all to the good. Um, the other, so this is why I wanted to separate it out though, um, because that doesn't, I don't think it then follows that only Brits can play British roles and only actors genuinely from the South can play. I mean, that's ridiculous. It's also never going to happen because, you know, as an industry, we want, you know, we audiences want to see, um, you know, actors who, you, who they like and respect and love and can open a movie doing this interesting acting challenge and producers are going to cast them. And that's just, you know, that's the way it's going to work. So, um, yeah. but I also think there's no, there's, there's no reason whatsoever, um, you know, uh, to, to avoid, um, most of these things, you know, most, most circumstances in which an actor might be taking on uh, an accent or speaking a language that's not their own. But of course, I think, you know, being, uh, approaching all, you know, everything with sensitivity um, and thinking about individual circumstances and the audiences, you know, everything we do is worldwide now. Everything that, you know, that we commit to film is going to be seen by, if you're playing a Turkish character, it's going to be seen in Turkey. You know, so it, it really is, this is another thing I beat the drum about as loudly as I can whenever I have the opportunity, but getting the accents right is a matter of respect. Uh, so I think there's, there's overlap there as well. Um, but that said, uh, uh, you know, yeah, I think, I think there are limits to um, things we need to take absolutely off the table. And I think those things are pretty clear and, and, and for pretty good reasons. I, I spoke to uh, David Peterson a few weeks ago, who is a conlanger who creates, um, you know, artificial languages for, for movies. That's exciting. I'll have to check that out. And we were talking about, well, the first question I asked him is, why do you have a job? Why don't people just speak gibberish? You know, they can just make up stuff. And he said, well, actually, in the past, they used to, right? They used to just, they used to just invent gibberish. And, um, and he said, you know, audiences these days, they're smart and they expect authenticity and they know when something is fake. But um, like I'm wondering if let, let's say an accent is from like a tiny town in, in Ireland, um, maybe the only people in the whole world who will know that that accent is wrong are people from that tiny town in Ireland. So like, why does it matter? Like, why is it important to be authentic? Uh... It's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think several things. Uh, first of all, I think that just out of respect for those people in that town, they, they deserve that respect and deserve to be authentically represented just as much as anybody else anywhere else. Um, I also think that the cases are few where it's really going to be a tiny minority of people who will know 
Um, I think if you're doing Irish accents, um, you know, most of Ireland is going to have a sense, um, you know, of, of how accurate or not accurate those are. Um, so now we're talking about an entire nation, not a tiny town. I think, you know, you could probably work really hard to come up with an example where really just about nobody would know. Um, but for the most part, I think that's pretty unusual. Um, but also, you know, just the, the uh, I like your framing and I'm going to go back to it because essentially the same answer that David Peterson gave you, audiences are smart. Um, you know, we may not always know you know, in every particular, if an accent is, you know, is often in a sound here, there is something like that. We know if it doesn't feel right. We know if it's janky and doesn't fit together. We know, um, you know, you could, in the same way as, you know, there are very few people who are expert costume designers or fashion designers or clothing designers. An enormous amount of money and time and, and research um, and expertise is put into getting the costumes right for a production. Um, you know, this, getting the stitching to go, it's a historical production, getting the stitching to go exactly the same way and, you know, these incredibly teeny, teeny, tiny little details. And, you know, the average audience member is not pausing the frame and zooming in and examining the stitching on the costume, but they can tell nonetheless. It's, it's, it's that, like, it's that attention to detail and that sort of loving care and attention to the detail and the complexity and getting it right that all builds together into the creation of a, a, like a richly textured fabric of a whole, which is what makes stories really come to life and really compelling, what builds the whole world together. Um, and accents are a huge, huge, huge part of that, I think. And so when time and care and attention has gone into getting the details right, and then making it fit seamlessly within the fabric of the whole so that it's all working together and all part of building the world, we can tell, um, you know, in, in a second, we're really good at that, you know, as small group primates, um, you know, having evolved on the savannah and kind of being really good at recognizing, um, you know, the minute someone opens their mouth or moves in a certain way, you are a member of my group, you are not a member of my group. Um, we can't always put our finger on exactly what it is that's giving us that sense, but we're really good at it. Um, and, you know, and so, you know, just in my little bailiwick in, in the sounds, in, in accents, um, you know, we are, we've all had the experience of watching a performance uh, of somebody acting in an accent that's not their own. And it being like 99%, it's like, it's really pretty good, but then there's something and you can't quite put your finger on it. I have certain theories as to, you know, with certain actors doing certain accents kind of, you know, that like, uh, you know, I think 80% of the time that it's a British actor doing an American accent, it's really good, but it's not quite right. It's one of a handful of things. I was going to ask you, because I don't really know a lot about your industry, but I kind of got a feeling from, from some of your tweets that maybe in the, in the Hollywood production hierarchy, you know, it's like costumes are really important and camera gear is really important and maybe accent coaching somewhere down the bottom. I mean, is that fair? Is that? It's after the animal handlers who are very important, but, you know, um, but I'll give you another really telling detail. Um, so uh, a um, fellow dialect coach um, who also is a, is a manager and represents dialect coaches uh, now um, once went, uh, very recently went and went through all of the budgeting software packages that are used by productions in Hollywood. There's, you know, a handful of them. Um, she went through all of them. And, um, you know, they're the, they're the ones that help line producers put together the budget for a film. So they've got a certain number of default lines for, you know, all the various positions and all the various sort of items that go together uh, to make a budget. In none of them is there a default line for dialect coaching. It's wow. not part of the standard budgeting. Wow. Um, and, and this is, I think, it's, it's really, it's, it's telling and representative. Um, now, every production is different. Um, you know, every producer is different. Um, and so, you know, you can't, can't automatically make an assumption about any one production or film. But it is the case that all too often, uh, dialect coaching is an afterthought. Mm -hmm. um, it is brought on uh, too late. Um, they haven't budgeted for it, um, or not at all in some cases. And then, you know, sometimes we're fixing things after the fact, right? Sometimes the film is shot and somebody says, you know what? 
that actor's accent isn't really working. And then a coach will work with the actor, hopefully to, you know, to do some, some work and some prep. And then they go in and they record, you know, some of their lines or all of their lines sometimes. Um, that's very expensive, by the way. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. It makes more sense to prep, you know, to, to, to do it ahead of time. Um, but uh, I should also say that, you know, things are changing. Things are better now in terms of, you know, the industry taking this seriously and appreciating what an important aspect of storytelling uh, dialect coach accent is and therefore dialect coaching is. Um, it's better than it's ever been. We're nowhere near where we need to be. Um, I have been fortunate on, um, I mean, I've, I've seen some change in, in my own career that I think is partially a result of the conversation moving on and people getting a little bit better about this, partially just, you know, m my career getting a little bit more successful along the way. So different opportunities opening up, but I have, you know, sort of in the, in the last few years, last sort of several projects I've done, I've, I've been really lucky to have that lead time, to have that six to 12 weeks before uh, starting shooting to, uh, you know, to, to really work with the actors um, to get something right so that it's in them when we start to shoot. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, it is one of the things that I'm out there trying to, you know, trying to say every opportunity that I can, um, which is, this is hugely important. It's really hard stuff. Um, it is not, actors are not, you know, they, they don't have the expertise in this. Some are very, very good at this, right? Some accents are brilliant at doing accents because they've been doing that, you know, playing around with it and doing it and working on it for a really long time, like all their lives, you know, because um, that's what it takes to get really good at it. That's not most actors. Um, I think this is part of what feeds into it as well is that I think, I think for a lot of producers, they don't necessarily really understand, uh, you know, what actors do generally because especially at very high levels, because they, they get to work with these wonderful, amazing, brilliant actors. And it looks like magic. You know, the actor shows up on set and they do these extraordinary things. And you're just like, wow, okay. So actors are, are magic basically. So you think it's just about hiring the right actor, the right, you know, who has the right magic um, without really sort of appreciating everything that goes into that. Um, so that's another, you know, sort of thing that hopefully we're working on demystifying a little bit. Um, but, you know, but getting actors the proper support, because you wouldn't ask them, I've been saying this recently, you wouldn't ask them to sew their own costumes, you know, to design or sew their own costumes. So why would you ask, ask them to, you know, design or master their own accents without any support? Yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible, especially since, um, obviously, what comes out of people's mouths is, is, is a massive part of the whole performance. A huge um, part of the experience of the audience of, of, of watching yeah. something, right? And this is why, this is the, the final point I'll, I'll just sort of throw in on that, is that audiences are way ahead of um, the industry as a whole on this. You know, in terms of audience expectations, you look at, you know, the reactions now when, when a movie comes out or even the trailer for a movie comes out uh, and, and people find something wanting in the accent. Um, you know, it's, it's really, really, really huge. So they are way ahead of where the industry is in terms of recognizing the centrality and the importance of getting the accents right. So I wanted to move on to ask you about some, some kind of practical questions about your, your day-to-day -day work. Um, so like ideally for you, like 12 weeks is, is a good amount of time to, to prepare an actor to, to do a, a different accent. Is that, is that right? Yeah, that's a really nice amount of time. Um, you know, I, I, it depends on the actor and the accent, how much they're going to have to do, you know, uh, the degree of difficulty of that task, what their facility is. So I, I often say something like six to 12 weeks, um, you know, and there are challenges that where, you, you know, you might want to start even earlier than that. Um, you know, portraying uh, a, you know, doing what I call idiolect work. You know, an idiolect is an individual person's accent. Um, but more than accent, really, we're talking then about things, you know, like just very characteristic vocal quality, just the sound of someone's voice as well. And, you know, actors often have to play real people, and sometimes they have to play real people who have incredibly famous voices. Um, I think there's more than one way to do that, more than one way to approach a performance like that. Think about it in a, you know, in a design sense. But one way uh, for sure um, is to try to get as close as you possibly can uh, to that voice to, you know, to really uh, 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 reproduce it in a way 
that is almost uncanny so that people are like, that's exactly how the person sounds. I can't believe it. You've brought them back to life. Uh, again, that's like, that's a fun little magic trick, right? Um, yeah. And uh, I, I think, you know, actors, actors sometimes very deservedly get uh, a lot of recognition or even awards for something like that, hopefully because the performance is also great and the story is also great, right? I don't think that's the only way to go about it. But certainly if you are aiming at that, if that's what you're doing when you're trying to play JFK or Marilyn Monroe or Muhammad Ali or Winston Churchill or something like that, um, that's something you want to take, you know, longer than 12 weeks. Maybe it's six months. Um, maybe it's a year. Um, but, uh, you know, that is really, really, really complicated and difficult and subtle stuff. So that takes time. And I'm curious about, about something that you've kind of mentioned a little bit so far, which is about individual variability, right? Because, like, I can't imagine, for example, Arnold Schwarzenegger doing, like, a, a Birmingham accent. Like, I just think... It, the, to me, that, that kind of thing moves into the realm of the impossible, but I don't know how you, how you see the... Arnold, if you're listening. <laughs> I mean, I didn't want to pick on any individual, but I'm giving an example of... I, I just feel like, um, you know, some... It's like you said, like some people have this kind of... this. I don't want to call it a talent, but they have this ability. I mean, what, what, what do you have any explanation for individual variability? First of all, uh, you know, Arnold's first language is Austrian, of course, is, is Austrian German. Um, so, you know, when you are working in a second language, that is a completely different order of things. That is vastly, vastly, vastly more difficult. Um, you know, the number of non-native speakers of English uh, who are going to move from, you know, not sounding like a native speaker to sounding like a native speaker in six to 12 weeks of prep, no matter how many hours you're putting in, that's a very small number of people. That's always going to be a lot harder, take a lot longer. Um, so, you know, but just confining the, uh, the conversation to native speakers or the subject to native speakers, um, the way we get good at doing accents is by doing accents. Um, you know, I, I used all of my linguistic and phonetic and articulatory training to sort of break stuff down and analyze it on a linguistic level um, you know, analyze the prosody, analyze the vowel system and the consonant system, analyze, uh, you know, things like articulatory settings or what I call oral posture. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and then communicate that, teach that to the actor in practical ways and sort of put it all back together. Um, so there's a lot that goes into it and a lot that I do and, and, and a lot of training and, and, uh, and understanding that I'm really glad that I have. But ultimately, at its root, at its base, this is a human capacity. You know, learning the sound system of a spoken variety of, of a language is something we all do, those of us who speak at least, uh, as human beings. It's, it's part of our inheritance and our equipment. Um, you know, people talk about the sort of magical age of 12, right? 12 is kind of the magical dividing line between uh, both in terms of accent and in terms of language, right? If you move to a new place before you're 12, you're going to end up sounding like a native, even if you don't speak the language. My, my mother, actually, my mother is Swedish. She moved to England when she was 12 um, and uh, uh, didn't speak any English. Um, and she, you know, she now sounds like a native speaker of English, although exactly which kind of English, it's a little confusing. Um, but she definitely sounds like a native speaker. Um, so, you know, even if it's a language, but certainly fixed an accent, and, and so therefore you're doomed, right? If you're older than 12 and you're learning a new language, you move to a new place, you're doomed. You, can, you will never sound like a native. And I think, uh, you know, to, just to hark back to that for a moment, like yes and no. Um, but I think what often does not get accounted for in that, because there is something to that sort of magic age, right? There's individual variation, of course, and there are always gonna be outliers, of course. But it comes back to identity again. Um, because I think, you know, that's a really crucial age. I have a 12 year old, by the way, I have a 12 year old and a 15 year old. So I'm studying it at close hand. Um, you know, there's, you're, you're starting to fix your identity through those years. And, you know, if you talk to people who moved from New Orleans to Connecticut or vice versa, um, you know, or Melbourne to London or whatever, um, when they're 11, you know, or when they were 12, 
you so often what you'll hear is I very consciously adopted the new accent as quickly as I could so I wouldn't get beat up, so I wouldn't get teased, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's very strong incentive right there. Um, but again, identity, you know, you're starting to form and fix your identity. And so I think one of the things that gets harder, it's not just sort of brain plasticity or hearing it. Um, I think those things are factors, but I think we, we put too much of the explanation on that and not enough on, well, you know, if you're 13, you might actually not want to make that decision um, about who you are. You might have this kind of hybrid identity. So you might switch back and forth between two varieties, two accents, or you might just end up with something that kind of sounds in between, right? Because that is your, you know, your complex identity as it's being formed. Sorry, I've gone far afield because the question was, um, you know, how to account for individual variability and, you know, inability. Um, it's practice and time. Um, you know, the people who are really good at doing accents really without exception do accents. So, you know, and we're talking about regular people, not actors necessarily. Like, you know, the guy who gives you your, your coffee in the morning, uh, who does the really great London accent, um, and he's not from London, he's American or whatever. Um, you know, the reason he's really good at doing that London accent is because he does it every morning when he hands you your coffee, you know, he's constantly sort of in it and playing around with it. That's how we get good at it. So all of my, you know, techniques and knowledge and, and, and sort of ability to analyze and break it down and name it exactly what's going on here um, is tremendously useful. Um, but the, you know, the way I got good at it first, uh, because I was good at doing accents before I understood this stuff, it's kind of part of what led me into it, was because I was always interested and always playing around and always doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's the main thing that accounts for individual variability. But it's also not true that somebody simply like is good at accents or isn't good at accents. It's going to be different for different accents. Um, and there then too, we come back to identity and imagination. Um, I, uh, so I, uh, I coach, uh, quite a lot of black British actors in African American accents. Um, that is a very strange thing. Um, you know, sort of coming back to what we we're talking about before, I, you know, will always, you know, make sure that we talk about this, uh, before we start, you know, and, and, you know, recognize how weird it is and how wrong it is that like that, that, that a white guy is like teaching an accent that really doesn't belong to me and that I have no business doing. It's not something I will. And, and I, I do model accents when I'm teaching, you know, when I, when I'm working with an actor, we always want to work from a primary source. That's, you know, never, never, never anything different than that, but I'll still model an accent so that we're, you know, then I'm pulling them towards me and we're, you know, we're hearing those sounds. Um, I find that quite challenging. Um, you know, I'm, I'm only ever going to do it in privately in a room or in a one-on-one -on -one session with an actor who, you know, says, yes, I understand. Thank you for saying that, but I trust you. I want to learn this from you. Let's move ahead. Um, and, but even then it's very challenging for me sometimes. Um, I've done it enough now that I, you know, that I kind of know what I have to get over, but it, it, there's, there's a resistance there. And the resistance is about, you know, feeling for very good reasons um, you know, a, 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 a permission structure, a kind of like, I shouldn't be doing this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just, I think, one example of a block that somebody could have towards doing an accent. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I think there are, there are reasons why certain accents are more accessible for certain people and less accessible and things like that. Yeah. So, so maybe um, a part of, part of taking on the identity, right? Part of the act of imagination isn't just understanding the culture, maybe, um, but also kind of respecting it and uh, maybe even admiring it, learning to love the, the all of the cultural aspects? I mean, you know, actors are taught um, that you cannot condescend to your character. Um, and, and also, and this is, I, I think, a, a sort of a version of that, a slightly more sort of simplistic version of that, but that like, nobody thinks they're evil, you know? So when you're playing the bad guy, when you're playing the villain, you really have to believe that what you do, that there's a good reason for what you're doing, that you're justified in what you're doing, right? Um, and, you know, if you don't, um, if you're condescending to a character, if you're playing a character as evil, 
it, it ends up being very boring um, for you and for the audience. Um, you know, you're reducing the complexity of a three-dimensional human being into something that's really flat and, and you know, and uninteresting. It's just a judgment, right? Um, that's not how human beings are. That's not, that's not our internal experience. That's not how we live and go about things. Even, you know, even the, the most evil among us, perhaps. Um, you know, and definitely if you're condescending to a character, if you're making a character, you know, a figure of, of fun, uh, you know, a simpleton or something like that. I mean, there are places certainly for performances like that, broadly comic performances like that. They're probably still not the most interesting work. They're, a, you know, a sideline in something else that's happening. Um, but yeah, you, you, you really can't do that. That is, that is death to anything interesting coming out of the, you know, the acting performance, the portrayal of a person. And so I think that very much carries over to the accent. So yeah, that's, that's, that's well said. Let, let's imagine that I, that I came to you and I said, um, you know, look, Eric, I, I'm, I'm going to start work as, as an actor next week. And I need a text, not, not, not next week, sorry, um, in six months. And I need uh, a Texas accent you know, like a Texas cowboy accent. What, I mean, what, what does a class actually look like? Like what's the, where would we begin? What's the process? Well, so listen, well, which Texas accent, right? Is what we start with. Um, so, you know, I mentioned before, um, cause there's not one, um, that, you know, we always, 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 always are working from a native speaker of the target accent as a model. Uh, there, are, there's a small little area of, of, of exception, and that's where there aren't native speakers of whatever we're doing because we're doing a made-up accent, right? Or it's an accent in a fantasy world where, you know, they speak a con like that David Peterson has created or something, and we're saying, well, how do they sound when they speak English? Um, in that case, we're making it up, and I'm the model, right? Um, or, you know, if I, if I want, you know, I'll, I'll have a female colleague record, you know, record some material or something if I want a female voice for cast members to listen to as well. But by and large, 99% of the time, what we're doing is we're going on a search first for a native speaker model. Um, and I, I frequently tell actors that, and I, and I do this, by the way, with civilians, um, you know, who really want to work towards a native speaker like sound as well, because again, it's, it's leveraging that basic human equipment of acquiring sounds. Um, so there, there are kind of three criteria. Um, has to be an actual native speaker. So as wonderful as Meryl Streep's Polish is in Sophie's Choice or Daniel Day-Lewis's Belfast is in, in The Name of the Father, we don't use them as models. We want to use an actual native speaker of a target accent. So we're not, you know, because ultimately, even if it's something good, we'd be making like a Xerox of a Xerox of a Xerox of a Xerox, and it degrades. Um, number two is you want it to be uh, somebody who roughly matches your vocal quality. Um, so that often means matching gender. Um, but, and, and that is so that we're, uh, so that we're not having to listen around that listen around, you know, of, of widely different vocal quality to the actor's own um, so that we can focus in on the accent. Because we're not trying to work up an impression. After all, we're trying to figure out the, you know, the accent itself, which is the speech actions of consonants and vowels and how they fit together in connected speech uh, and the prosody and the oral posture. Those are kind of the three components. Um, and the third thing, though, is that it needs to click. Uh, it needs to be someone who feels right. And if we're talking about an actor, you know, finding the model for a particular character, it should be the voice where the actor hears that person speak and says, that's it. That's my character. Um, usually this is a conversation between the director and the actor and me. Um, and it can take some time. You know, I, I will often produce... Um, you know, a sort of speaker sheet of six to 10 or 12 different speakers with, you know, sort of like pictures of them and descriptions and a YouTube link um, where, you know, I've selected them all as ones that will be, you know, that would be appropriate um, and that roughly match the actor in some way, but still cover some kind of variation so that there's room for the director and the actor to kind of say, yes, this is, this is it. This is the way we want to tell the story. So that's before we ever start doing any actual work is we have to figure that out because, um, we, it's again, it's, it's how we learn, right, from a close study of, of a small handful of other human beings. Um, but also because that way we are, we know we're working authentically, right? If, uh, you know, if, if, if I have done my work and made sure that these are really authentic representations of that, you know, that accent, that social class, that background, that place and time, whatever. Um, and then we're going to make sure that we really, really, really get the details right. 
right? Sort of get the, get all of the texture right. This is, I sometimes get asked, how do you avoid stereotype? This is a great question I love to hear from actors, right? Because it's always a concern. And one of the things I always want to make really clear is that a broad accent, you know, or what we might describe as being a very strong, very obviously regional accent, doesn't automatically mean it's a stereotype, right? A stereotype is a reduction in complexity. It's drawing with too broad a brush. Um, so one of the ways that we avoid stereotype, of course, is always working from a native speaker. Um, but another is working in detail with depth and complexity and texture. Because if you, if, you, if you work to calibrate all of those things and figure out how they fit together and get it right, it's not a stereotype. You know, we're, we're working again towards three-dimensionality rather than flattening something out. Um, but we do want to, that's that third criteria, we do want to sort of feel that click. Um, so then what we'll actually do in terms of how we actually work, it really, it, it can vary so widely because different actors work in different ways, different people work in different ways. Um, but, uh, you know, we will always be working some of the time, uh, a lot of the time on individual articulation targets, like the specific vowel sounds and consonant sounds in that accent, in that sound system. Um, we'll be working some on the oral posture because it's the, it's the groundwork that, you know, that sort of underlies what that sound system is. Um, phoneticians call this articulatory settings. I tend to call it oral posture or vocal tract posture. I think it's a little more accessible. Um, but, you know, where, uh, where the jaw and the lips and the tongue and even the soft palate and the back of the mouth and the larynx itself where those things like to hang out, where they return to at rest or in between, you know, brief little pauses in the middle of speech. Um, sometimes you can hear aspects of that in the hesitation sounds or thinking sounds that people make when they, uh, 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 you know, you don't know exactly uh, what sound is coming next. So you go to a kind of a, you know, a neutral place. If it's French, it's a, uh, Hello, I don't know, that's something different from A, uh, which is different from M. You know, if you're Scottish, it's a M. I don't know, it's a, you know, and all of those are, they're, they're little keys, they're little sort of clues to aspects of the oral posture. But the oral posture, when we can put it all together and, 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 and put it together into this felt uh, groove, right? It's the shape and feel of the accent. It's the reason why all the individual sounds are what they are. So I think even for non-native speakers um, working on intelligibility, um, you know, it's worth spending some time figuring out well, what, are, what are some oral posture adjustments I might make. And I think anybody, honestly, anybody who speaks two languages with reasonable proficiency knows that their mouth feels a little different in one than it does in the other. It's like, oh, yeah, this is how Spanish feels in my mouth. This is how Russian feels in my mouth. This is how English feels in my mouth. That's, that's posture. That's oral posture. Um, but we can, we can go deeper, we can go directly at it and we can go deeper and we can get really refined in terms of making those adjustments. And then once those are integrated and owned, it helps a lot of the sounds start to sort of fall in place. Otherwise you're doing a kind of a cut and paste job. You know, if we just do individual sounds um, and layer those on top of an existing oral posture, it's not gonna work. Um, so I think, you know, sometimes, again, actors who are brilliant at this or people who are brilliant at doing accents, often they're working on it totally unconsciously. They may never even think about it, but they're instinctively still making those adjustments to their oral posture to make, you know, it's because it's the logic that underlies the sound system. Mm -hmm. And then the third big thing is prosody. Um, so, you know, we got to get the music right. So that's, that's the movement of pitch, um, you know, th those pitch contours, how the voice rises and falls, um, but also things like rhythm and stress. I've heard you again, I've heard you in, in other interviews talking about oral posture and and, and when I first heard you talking about it, it reminded me of some of probably the more ridiculous, well, they seem ridiculous to me, stories about oral posture, like, because um, I was born in Australia, and people say, Australians um, talk with their mouth, yeah, they talk with their mouth closed because there's so many flies in Australia. Yeah, you don't want to let the bugs in, right? So you got to, you know, <laughs> keep it kind of, kind of wide and flat like that. Either that, or sometimes they say it's because you're squinting up at the sun. Uh, right, so everything kind of goes wide like that. Or you don't, you know, you don't want to let the dust in, is the other one they say. Uh, so it's kind of, it seems incredible to me that, I know that's not the reason, but... Um, oh, no, it's absolutely the reason. I think linguistics has studied this in some depth, and the conclusion has come back that is absolutely correct. It is also true that the reason why uh, Welsh accents 
have a lot of melody, right? A lot of up and down like that is because of the rolling hills of Wales. That's absolutely true. None of these are true. They're, they're just so stories um, that my profession has been very, 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 very guilty. Um, even some great coaches of kind of passing along and perpetuating. And, I, you know, I, it's understandable, I think, we like to tell stories like that and they're very sort of vivid and accessible. And also if you think about it from an actor's point of view, it can be very useful up to a point because again, it kind of gets your imagination going and gets you to start to sort of move towards some kind of cultural context thing maybe. Like, oh, that's what the landscape is like in Wales. I can kind of imagine that and I'm finding an analog in my speech kind of thing. I. You know, um, I actually will encourage actors um, to make connections uh, between the features of the accent, whether it's individual specific vowel and consonant pronunciations or features of prosody or features of oral posture, and the character that they're finding, that they're building. Um, and, and I think that in some really transcendent accent performances, um, everything feels like it's of a piece. Everything makes sense together. If you think about uh, something I've talked about before, but Heath Ledger in Brokeback Mountain um, is doing a kind of, I think, Wyoming uh, accent, you know, very just sort of Western accent, but it's very particular, it's very specific. And he's got a really kind of twisted up, tight bound up on one side oral posture. Um, the accent is great. It's more than that. It's very specific and textured. And it feels like it has mirrors in the character's soul and where he is. Um, and I think that, so I try to walk a line between always saying, look, it is not true um, that, you know, New Yorkers have their jaws a little bit forward, maybe a little bit of jaw protrusion because they're tough or because they're defended or because they live in an urban environment, you know, no. Um, language changes all the time, right? It changes according to a certain logic that has to do with like group affinity and separation and contact and things like that. But the specific changes that happen, that are happening all the time are essentially arbitrary. Um, you know, so I think it's very then easy to conclude once you look at that and understand that and know that, that like, you just can't draw those connections. You can't say these people talk this way because they are this way, or there's this particular feature in, in this accent or this language or these people's speech because their culture is this way. Um, but at the same time, if we can find specific imaginative connections and we're being, you know, smart and, and, and artistic about how we're making those choices, um, making sure that we're not condescending to the character and that we're building something that's three-dimensional and textured, that can be really exciting. I mean, that was a, a beautiful um, speech, to be honest, Eric. <laughs> really? Um, was that not your question? I kind of jumped on it, didn't I? <laughs> no, it was, it was, it was amazing. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, though, if, if there's, in your experience, is talking about oral posture, is, is there um, kind of an oral posture that is, that is found throughout, let's say, um, the general American uh, accent that, that might help foreign learners to maybe find some, some of those English sounds more, more easily? That's a great question. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, first just very briefly take issue with the term general American. Um, okay. But is, isn't that actually a technical, um, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a, a named accent, right? The, the GA. Linguists tend not to talk about general American. Um, okay. It is a term that's in use um, that, that linguists kind of hate um, for a couple of reasons. I, I won't uh, go on about this at too much length because there's a practical question here that I'm sure your listeners are more interested in. I tend to call it so-called general American. Um, just, you know, it's almost a tick of mine. Um, I have accent materials where it's abbreviated SCGA, um, which indicates that like, I haven't really thought of a better term, um, but I want to always call it into question. I want to always side eye it. It's problematic because two big reasons. One, um, who are these general Americans? I don't know any general Americans. Um, it, 
what we're talking about when we're talking about an, a, you know, a general American accent is an accent that generally sounds white. It's associated with white people. Um, it is uh, specifically probably college educated. So we're kind of talking upper middle class, middle class, you know, upper, upper middle, upper something. Um, and non-regionally specific, right? I can't tell where you're from. And, that's, and it's that last part that people kind of say, oh, that's what it means, but it really codes some other things as well that I think is really problematic. Um, it's also a problem just because it isn't one thing. There isn't one general American accent. It really is more negatively defined. It's defined by the absence of certain features. So, you know, if you say coffee or thought, uh, that's New York. It's not general American. Um, you know, if you say hot, uh, it's Great Lakes. It's not General American. If you say time and high, it's Southern, so it's not General American. Um, you know, if you say axe, that's African American usage, so that's not General American. Um, so, but within that, there's a huge amount of variation. Um, to take uh, just one more example, because this this is practically useful for for second language speakers, I think. Um, you know, there's something called the caught caught merger. Um, which is uh, pronouncing the words C-O-T, like a rollaway bed, and C-A-U-G-H-T, the past tense of catch, um, so I caught something, is pronouncing those exactly the same, right? Caught, caught, or maybe caught, caught. Um, my native accent, I grew up in Connecticut, and then I had, you know, trained as an actor in England and then became a speech teacher, so, you know, I don't know, what I have exactly, all that I think it's pretty close to, I made some efforts and I think it's pretty close to what I grew up speaking. I have two different vowel sounds there, caught, caught, ah, uh, ah. Uh. They're similar, um, but they are distinct. Half of North Americans have a caught, caught merger and half don't. So your immediate problem as a non-native speaker, if, if what you're targeting is American English rather than say British English, is what are you gonna do about that? It's an extra phoneme, it's a whole extra sound. Um, so that is a huge difference, right? It's, it's, it's deep, deep structural difference in terms of like how many sounds do you even have in your accent? Um, so, you know, as a, as a non-native speaker learning English, you, can't, you have a choice there there's not a right or a wrong choice. There's not one that's more correct and one that's less correct. It's not better to have more sounds. Um, you know, it's, it's historically, like that's a more conservative accent, the one that has the extra phoneme. Um, but at the same time, one thing that we know from the study of linguistics is that mergers really only go one way. So, you know, 75 years from now, everybody will be caught, caught, merged. So that's the wave of the future. So maybe you want to go that way. Um, so it's really individual. There's not a right or the wrong. But again, that's another problem with general American because you can find a whole bunch of general American speakers, people who are like, yeah, that's just general American, um, who have that caught-caught merger and a whole bunch of people who don't have that caught-caught merger. And that's like one of the biggest differences that you can even imagine. So it's not one accent. Okay. That was too long. Sorry. But um, the... The, uh, I can still offer some helpful tips. Um, they are general <laughs> um, because we're generalizing across, you know, a huge variety, even if we're just talking about so-called general American, still generalizing across a huge variety of speakers and accents. But, and it's always relative, right? Oral posture is a relative thing. It's where are you coming from and where are you going to? Um, but coming from most other languages, and certainly most European languages, um, most Americans move their jaws more. Um, so we can talk about jaw height um, in terms of, you know, sort of a, a resting position. Again, pay attention to those hesitation sounds or those thinking sounds. Um, but we can also talk about how much movement there is. And Americans, for the most part, generalizing, tend to move their jaws more and open their mouths more. The, the, there's kind of, you know, a, a, a more open position more of the time um, than the vast majority of Spanish speakers, Italian speakers, uh, German, Scandinavians, French speakers, Russian speakers. Like, that's very often a direction that we're moving. Um, a very crude tip or experiment that you can try is to speak English while chewing gum. Um, or even just imagining that you're chewing gum. 
um, I will encourage clients sometimes to <laughs> try it out. Uh, to, uh, it also works for Australia, by the way. Um, but to, uh, you know, to make fun um, of Americans. Be a stick, because, you know, we can play with stereotype. Um, and certainly, you know, in the privacy of your own home behind closed doors, like by all means, because we can learn stuff from that. So another exercise I'll, I'll often have non-native speakers do is do a really broad, like really offensively bad, broad American accent in your native language, right? So, so play around with, develop a whole character, work up a whole routine of being like the worst kind of American tourist in Rome asking for directions. Um, in St. Petersburg, asking how you can get to the, you know, the, 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 the Dunkin' Donuts or something. Um, you know, like go really far. What you'll discover, first of all, hopefully you'll make yourself laugh and you'll have some fun. And that's always good, right? That's really helpful for learning. But you'll probably also discover that you know some stuff about the oral posture of American English, of American accents um, that you like didn't know you knew um, and, you know, or that you're not really giving yourself the permission to go towards. Um, and you can, and it's fun. Um, and one of the things that you'll probably find is that you're moving your mouth and your jaw around a lot. Um, so, you know, leaning in that direction. Um, you know, another thing that I'll say is that, uh, General American is so much about this very weird R sound that we have. Um, it's a super weird, complex articulation. It barely exists in any other language. Um, it is, it is it's sometimes historically described in phonetics literature as being a retroflex R, which is an R sound where your tongue tip is curling back. It is not that. Um, there are some local regional American accents and, you know, maybe places like Oklahoma where people are doing something like that. But for the most part, that is not the way Americans make their R sounds. Um, it's sometimes called a molar R or a bunched R. Um, you can find MRIs of it uh, on, you know, on the web, which is a great thing to do. Um, but we're, you know, we're bringing the sides of our tongue up, bring the whole tongue back a little bit usually, sometimes a lot, but you don't have to. Um, and bringing the sides of our tongue up into contact with our molars and bicuspids, uh, you know, the upper, the upper side, sometimes inside, sometimes just touching the sort of the chewing surfaces of them and going, er, er. That is such a common sound. We have so many R's in any utterance um, that it's one that starts to really affect and even dominate the oral posture. Um, so that's one that is really worth the time um, getting to know, finding familiarity and comfort with. Another uh, tiny little tip I'll throw in about this is just that it's a big muscular action and it is quite awkward. Um, it's, so if it feels awkward, it's because it's new and unfamiliar, but even when you've mastered it and it's become very familiar, it will still be a little bit awkward. It's a little awkward for us. It's a weird thing to do with your tongue. Um, so like, don't be afraid of that. You can even lean into that. Um, I'll sometimes use a, you know, kind of a metaphor just going back and forth between sort of RP and some kind of general American um, being the difference between fighting with a small sword, you know, that just has a point, the kind of, you know, like a foil that you do with fencing and fighting with a big two-handed broadsword. Um, you know, so there's something that's a little bit slower, a little bit more ponderous about the movements of maybe the tongue, especially um, when you're talking about American English that, you know, flowing through all of those and even slowing it down and exaggerating it a little bit. There's something there. There's something there that is real and that I think you can usefully kind of lean into the feel of as you practice. Yeah, uh, that, that's really interesting, actually, because, you know, whenever I'm doing my um, American tourist looking for a Dunkin' Donuts accent, you know, it's always about the R's. I want to hear that. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, but I know that when I do it, I'm, I'm, I'm overplaying the, the R. Like, I know that, that my R, I, I think it's not only too strong, but I'm doing it too much. And sometimes what that is, is, and, and you know, you actually, like Australians are, are even though you're, you're non-rhotic, um, the R that you use before vowel sounds is, is usually pretty similar, actually. So you probably are doing work you don't have to do. 
Um, but, mm-hmm. uh, but very often for people, if, if, if they're feeling like they're doing too much or it's too strong or it's over-exaggerated, it is because they're going for that sort of retroflex thing, which in and of itself has a similar sound, but it's hugely different muscularly. So it affects everything around it. So going into or out of the sound, it's very, very different if you're using a curled back retroflex R as opposed to this back and sides of tongue bunched up towards the upper teeth R. It's hugely different. Obviously, when, when you're working with a, with a client and they're, and they're producing sound, what's, what's the best way for them to get feedback? Is it, is it, is it let's say you're not around, is it like recording themselves and listening to it? I mean, what, what are some techniques that people can use to practice on their own? A variety of strategies. Um, I mean, you know, ultimately, whatever works. Um, And I think one thing that we know generally about what works with the acquisition of any new skill set is to do a bunch of things. Um, We know this from language learning too, right? I mean, really successful language learners are usually using multiple strategies. They're um, they're doing immersion and listening. They're doing mirroring and shadowing. They're studying some grammar. They're doing some reading. They're having some conversation. They're studying vocabulary and making flashcards. They're not doing any one thing. It's a multiplicity of connections because that, you know, it works on a neurological level, right? That we're, we're forging more neuronal connections when we're using a variety of strategies. Um, I think, you know, weight training or any kind of sort of physical training is another good example because, uh, you know, people will doing one kind of strength training, one set of exercises for a long period of time, people get much, much stronger very fast when they first start and then they plateau. Um, and what you have to do is you have to completely change everything up and introduce some kind of element of, of, of confusion. So your muscles go, oh, oh, okay, now we have to adapt again, right? Um, I do think that uh, recording yourself and listening back is a useful tool. Um, as long as it's not the only thing you're doing, Um, as long as it's something you should probably keep it to, you know, like, uh, you know, it's something you do 20 to 30% of the time. Um, Reading out loud is phenomenal and fantastic. You should do that a lot. And only some of the time you should record yourself reading out loud. Um, Something I think can be very, very useful when you're, you know, working on your own, uh, being your own coach is, um, if there's a particular sound you're working on, uh, pick up a text you haven't read before and go through and actually mark all the places where that sound is. You know, one of the things that's difficult about English, of course, is its vowel system is immensely complex. There are, uh, there are five vowel sounds in Spanish, a, e, i, o, and u, and five is the exact average number of vowel sounds for a language. English has, depending on the variety, 22, 24, it has a lot. And spelling is useless. It's utterly useless. Uh, So, you know, we were talking about intelligibility. One of the reasons why that's not uh, necessarily a low bar, not a simple task, um, is because first of all, you gotta throw away spelling. There are no sound spelling correspondences that are reliable. You have to learn the sound system via, you know, some sort of different method recognizing what all those sounds are. And you have to keep them all distinct. So they don't have to sound like native speaker versions, any of them, but you do have to have a different E and I so that the words green and grin and sheep and ship and other various dangerous pairs that most people are aware of sound consistently different. Um, That goat and thought, O and aw and ah, all sound consistently different from each other. Uh, Strut, the uh sound in words like under and love and mother is notoriously tricky. Um, because the way that most varieties of English where we have that vowel is in a very indistinct place that most languages don't have a vowel sound in, but it's close to a lot of others. So it's very hard to hear accurately and very easy to just substitute one from your native language. Um, So, you know, whatever you're working on, uh, go through a text, uh, find all the places where that sound is. Um, Just that exercise sometimes is difficult if it's like identifying a vowel sound with all the different spellings. So you're getting, you know, by doing that a lot, you're getting used to looking for them and sensitizing yourself, attuning yourself to, you know, the words that have that vowel sound. Um, And then read it aloud, you know, and if you're recording yourself, one of the good things about recording yourself, I think, is that you are, especially for actors, you're outsourcing the listening to a separate part of yourself, a later part of yourself in time. 
so you can be inside the experience of it when you're doing it, which is where we want to be. Um, and you're not always listening to yourself. Um, and then you can listen back and you can reliably catch, you know, with a different ear, putting on a different hat. Um, you know, oh, I got that one. Oh, I missed that one. Um, you know, and you may notice places where you, uh, you didn't, you know, didn't circle or highlight the appropriate sound in the text. And you, you'll learn by doing that as well. Honestly, I never considered that reading out loud w would be a, a great activity for... Oh, my God. Oh, it's, it's wow. yeah. I mean, I, I don't know how you would, I don't know how you would, you, you would really make progress, uh, you know, in any pronunciation target without doing a hefty amount of that. Um, Obviously, talking is great. But the thing <laughs> is, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's much harder um, to focus on specific pronunciation tasks, uh, you know, or, or working on those, those particular speech skills when you are also engaged in a conversation with a human being because you're paying attention to them and you're also paying attention to forming the thoughts that you're having and communicating, and you should be. Um, so, you know, I often talk about there's kind of like, there's three stages of mastery of an accent. One is where you can do it perfectly on, you know, a memorized text that you've worked a lot on. You know everything about it and exactly where everything needs to be. That's actually, unfortunately, that's mostly what we're doing, right? Um, that's the easiest, that's the first stage of mastery. The second stage is when you can do the exact same thing, do it perfectly with a text you've never read before, never worked on before. That's still easier than the most difficult stage of mastery, um, which coming back to the advice that you generally give language learners, um, you know, to, to give some support to, to why that is, I think, a wise thing to, you know, to place to start from. Because it's really friggin' hard to do it when you're talking, when you're just talking, you're thinking of what you're gonna say, you're paying attention to the other person as well. Um, you know, that's, that's true and full mastery of an accent or of another language is when you can do it perfectly in that circumstance as well. But that is the hardest thing. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense to me. It makes perfect sense, uh, especially for second language learners who are obviously are also trying to think of the grammar or the vocabulary. You know, it's a memory. Yeah, so many more tasks. Yeah, that's why it's, it's so difficult. Just one final question, because um, unfortunately, uh, in, in, you know, in the world that I work in, um, there are lots of people who've grown up with the idea that, um, that they can't communicate effectively if they have uh, a non-native accent and they want to get rid of their accent. What would you say to, to those people who, who, you know, feel bad about their accents and they, and they, and they want to, they want to get rid of them? Yeah. Um, that breaks my heart. Um, you know, uh, again, I think there is a, there is a slight difference um, in this issue when we're talking about native speakers and non-native speakers. Um, you know, it is purely and unambiguously true uh, that there is absolutely nothing, linguistically speaking, that makes one native speaker variety better than, more sophisticated than, more right or true or correct more neutral, more representative of a language than any other native speaker variety. This is, this is um, you know, again, we should all be shouting it from the rooftops. I look forward to a day when everybody has some basic linguistic education in secondary school, maybe starting in primary school, um, you know, appreciating other, other native speaker varieties um, so that we can just do away with that entirely. Maybe one day we'll get there. Um, you posed the question really well, which is, you know, what, what would I say to someone? And I, I, I had to say, I haven't actually run across this recently. I haven't had someone come to me in at least a good few years and say, I am uh, so insecure about my native accent or um, the way people see me at work or something that I want to fundamentally change it. Um, but I have had in the past. And, you know, and what I do is I have this conversation with them. Um, ultimately, it's an individual choice. Um, people do it without seeking out accent reduction, or which is you know, another terrible term, but it's, it's what it's often known as, um, or without seeking out the help of a coach. People do. Um, they, you know, because the, the real world that we live in, uh, we do have linguistic discrimination. Um, and individual human beings have reasons for, um, you know, wanting to 
advance or be taken seriously or whatever um, in certain real world situations in the real world that we live in. And, um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm here to help empower individual people, right? As, as a dialect coach with actors, I'm in support of actors telling the story that they and the director want to tell. Um, if I'm working with an individual person, it's because they, you know, they have a need and I want to help them. Um, I do think that code switching, um, for, again, if we're talking about native speakers, is a um, perhaps more sane and less self-violent way of going about encountering these kinds of realities. So developing a way of speaking that works for what your purposes are, um, that is a mode that you have, a register that you have, rather than completely fundamentally replacing um, something about who you are and, you know, and where you came from. Um, but, you know, but, but starting above all with just, you know, saying, this is wrong, this shouldn't be, this isn't the way it should work. Non-native speakers, it's different because, you know, all non-native speakers, almost all non-native speakers, most non-native speakers want to sound like a native or as close as possible to, you know, have as good pronunciation as possible. And again, accent discrimination, linguistic dis discrimination is a real world thing that a lot of people encounter. Um, so again, it starts with having this kind of conversation. I think the paths and the solutions ultimately are individual ones. They're up to an individual. Um, you know, what I try to do is give somebody as much, you know, context and linguistic information as I can. Um, and then we, you know, we sort of, we go from there. Um, you know, in practice, again, when working with non-native speaker civilians who just want to move towards sounding like a native speaker, most of the work is the same you know, whatever our goal is, because it is such a long road, most of what we're going to do in actual practice is going to be the same. And someone is only going to get to that, you know, spy-like level um, after sort of years of hard work put in if they really have this internal desire to sort of get there. Um, so it's, you know, it's definitely an important thing to, to talk about and then to think through and to give as much context as possible. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're generally with non-native speakers, we're working on a similar set of things regardless. Yeah. Um, well, well, uh, like you, I look forward to the day when we can just accept, um, well, I look forward to the day when, um, you know, accent prejudice, linguistic discrimination is as frowned upon as all other types of discrimination, right? Yeah. It's the last, it's often said that it's the last socially acceptable form of discrimination. I, yeah. I think there's some truth in that. I agree. Um, well, Mr. Eric Singer, thank you very much for your time.